Doc Talk is brought to you by Beringer Engelheim Vet Medica Inc., the makers of Pyramid 5 plus Presponse SQ, a market leader in combination respiratory vaccines. Hi there, folks. Welcome to Doc Talk. I'm sure glad you joined us. I'm Dr. Dan Thompson here from the College of Veterinary Medicine at Kansas State University. My guest today, Dr. Chris Reinhardt. Dr. Reinhardt is an extension specialist in feedlot cattle and endpoint management. And we're going to talk about ruminant nutrition, managing these cattle, and getting to that endpoint that, that is the most profitable. Thanks for watching, and I hope you enjoy the show. Say this is a calf that's been run through the chute a few too many times. Going through the chute stresses cattle, causing them not to eat like they should. Luckily, Pyramid 5 plus Presponse SQ provides proven protection against key respiratory diseases in a single shot with just one trip through the chute. Talk to your veterinarian about Pyramid 5 plus Presponse SQ, and soon your calves will relax and eat like a whole different animal. Closed caption brought to you by AgriLabs, the perfect pairing of performance and value. Well, Chris, welcome to the show. Thanks, Dr. Dan. <laughs> well, folks, this is Dr. Chris Reinhardt. And Chris is an associate professor here at Kansas State University. Yes, sir. Uh, you are the state feedlot extension specialist. And yes. so you do a lot of work with people out in the state. The other thing is, is he's one of my partners that has helped me direct over the last seven years the, the Beef Cattle Institute. And it's been a wild ride. But it's been a lot of fun. We got a lot more to do. And it's going to get a lot more fun. But folks, we're going to talk today about fat cattle and basically about getting those cattle out in a timely manner and some of the things that, that's going on in the industry. And let's start out, Chris, with uh, talking about, you know, the packer ask or, you know, what, how, is, how have the fat cattle changed over the last two decades as far as the, what they look like and, and carcasses? They're bigger and they're <laughs> blacker. That's the, that's the simple answer, but the real, you know, you want to back up to the 35,000 foot view right now. Anyone who's tried to buy a roast at retail in the last week to month knows what's going on in the beef industry. The price uh, is at rec record levels for retail and it doesn't show any sign of backing up. The world wants more of our product. Yeah, well, and, and with that, you know, the bigger and, and they're blacker, the blacker meaning more Angus genetics. Um, well, and even cattle that didn't used to have black coat colors now, different breeds have black coat colors um, because of that, that certified Angus beef uh, claim. But let's talk about size, carcass size and, and size of these cattle going into the plant. Why are we seeing the ask or why are people feeding them to these larger outweights? The first thing over the going back 20 to 30 years, the genetics have changed, but we can't blame it all on genetics. The genetics have really slowed down in about the last five to maybe even 10 years. We've started to flatten out that growth curve, uh, but growth promotion has changed over the last 20 years as well. We're using uh, more and more potent programs for growth promotion. Um, and then the, the real easy one is we're just simply feeding them longer and bigger uh, because of what you just said. The market has a huge demand for beef right now from the retail sector all the way back. And so pounds means money and, and pounds of beef to a certain extent are almost always worth more than the feed it takes to get them there. So when we're looking at supply and demand, the demand is high, our supply is short, so you're seeing these record prices. And, and I think that, that, you know, when you look at the drought and, and things and, and we look at the head counts in, in the feed yards. If, if, you, if the head count isn't there, then the pounds have to come from somewhere. I'm not an ag economist and I, I don't pretend to be as smart as those guys are, but the numbers are pretty simple. The math is pretty simple. The world wants more of our product and we've unfortunately lost a huge number of cows to any number of reasons. Yeah, and, and then put that on to uh, increased export markets and the ability as, as other countries have, have increased their, their uh, level of living or, 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 or ability, they want more animal protein. 
animal protein <clears throat> is really what made, has made, uh, I'll say, Western civilization what it is. Uh, quality protein in any form will change a society. Yep, and as people get money, they want more animal protein, they change their diets. Folks, when we come back, we're going to talk more with Dr. Chris Reinhardt here from Kansas State University, and we're going to get into some of those things in the carcass as far as quality grade, sorting cattle, and different things to that. You're watching Doc Talk, and we're tickled to death that you joined us today. We'll be back after the break. This Meet the Veterinarian is brought to you by Merck Animal Health, the science of healthier animals. Dr. Doug Ford is the owner of Beaver Creek Veterinary Clinic, located in Brush, Colorado. He is also a partner in Production Animal Consultation, a science-driven, people-focused group of advisors serving animal protein producers worldwide. Doug and his wife, Jan, are the proud parents of five adult children, and as a family, they are passionate stewards of their ranches and livestock. As dependable as the sunrise, in dairy parlors, open pastures, on ranches and feed yards across America, a place where reputation is more than a name, where the science of healthier animals is a way of life. It's the responsibility that drives who we are and what we do. Every decision, every day. It's your livelihood and our responsibility. Hi, I'm Kevin Oxner, host of NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen and Colorado Rancher. Join me each week as the National Cattlemen's Beef Association brings you the latest updates in industry information and market news. Plus, each week we provide important educational information and features on cattlemen from across the country just like you. And we can't forget our favorite cowboy poet, Paxter Black. Join me for NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen, debuting Tuesday nights at 8.30 Eastern right here on RFD TV. Beef producers asked for it, and Norbrook delivers. Introducing new Enroflox 100, the newest addition to your arsenal for treating bovine respiratory disease. Enroflox 100 is an FDA-approved, ready-to-use injectable antimicrobial solution to treat BRD associated with Mannheimia hemolytica, Pastorella multocida, and Histophilus somni in beef and non-lactating dairy cattle. Administered SQ as a multiple-day therapy. Consult with your veterinarian today about Enroflox 100, the new choice. This segment is brought to you by Norbrook Laboratories, manufacturers of Enroflox 100, the newest addition to your arsenal for treating bovine and swine respiratory disease. Hey there, folks. Welcome back to Doc Talk. I'm Dr. Dan Thompson here with my friend and colleague, Dr. Chris Reinhardt. We're both from the Beef Cattle Institute at Kansas State University, and today, uh, Dr. Reinhardt and I are discussing things associated with fat cattle procurement endpoint management of fat cattle in the feed yards and and as we left we we're talking about the quality or the quantity of beef <laughs> now now let's talk about quality and what are some of those drivers that we see for quality grade and things of that nature I, I gotta back up I've had a lot of opportunity to travel around the world and eat beef pretty much everywhere I've been and no disrespect to anybody around the world but the United States has the best beef on the planet and there's a simple reason several small simple reasons for that our cattle are young uh, when we when we harvest them and they're well marbled and I cannot get the quality of steak anywhere else on the planet that I can get right here pretty much anywhere in the United States well it's kind of like when you pick up the menu and you're out and it says being from Iowa originally Iowa corn fed beef or you know certified Angus beef you know you go through through some of these things that that you know, we even try to market the quality within the highest quality system. And so it's amazing to me what our producers and, and ranchers get done, and it is a dang good product. I was almost said a bad word there. Calm down. <laughs> our our beef, to. we've got quality genetics, we've got uh, a quality management program, and we market them at an endpoint that really, it's almost magical in terms of the consistency and uniformity of the product we're able to create. So talk to me a little bit about that. Let's go to some of the things that are that are in the Rolodex and, and basically the value of, of the choice and, and high choice and prime grades to that white tablecloth or, 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 or what is the value of that? People are willing to pay, anyone who's gone to some of these really nice or high-end restaurants, people will pay a tremendous amount 
for a quality eating experience. And again, if we manage these animals appropriately and market them at the appropriate end point, we can put a marvelous piece of meat on the table. Yeah, when somebody uh, you know gets a big raise or gets a job promotion, you don't hear somebody say, hey, let's run out and get us a sprig of broccoli, do you? <laughs> I've been there. I've <laughs> they'll been say there. they'll say let's go out and get a steak and celebrate and and so you're right when they they do go out it is that point in time where they're trying to put something on the table for them for their special occasion and and enjoy something that's special and it's uh, you know nine times out of ten it is is a beef product or a steak. So so how does that go into or how does that relate to our endpoint management? Or, or how does that relate to, to what we're doing today in these cattle? Simply put, we have to start with quality genetics, the genetics to deposit marbling. Uh, but, but within that, assuming we've got the genetics to deposit marbling, we still have to make the animal have enough total body fatness to deposit that marbling. There are very few cattle, uh, contrary to some people's opinion, there are very few cattle that'll marble really well at a very, very lean end point. We've got to get the cattle fat enough to deposit that marbling. So we're going to take a break, and then when we come back, we'll get back to that, well, how fat is fat enough, and how fat is too fat, and, and things to that nature, and when, when we should, should quit on, on feeding these cattle and, and get them to market. But it's, it's all related, folks, whether you're talking about cattle numbers, size of the carcasses, quality of the carcasses, and when we come back from the break, we're going to discuss that more with Dr. Chris Reinhardt. This segment was brought to you by Brute Cattle Equipment, makers of the Brute Stealth Hydraulic Chute. If the chute fits, swear by it. Visit our website for more information. This tip brought to you by Batrol 100 Enrofloxacin Injectable, now approved for use in controlling BRD in high-risk cattle. Batrol 100, right the first time, whether it's controlling BRD in high-risk cattle or treating BRD. Welcome to today's On the Farm Tip, sponsored by my friends over at Bear Animal Health. We're going to talk about market cow quality. 20% of gross revenue of cow-calf operations comes from market cows and market bulls being sold. When we think about sending an animal, whether it's to the sale barn or an animal to slaughter, we need to make sure that that's an animal that we want to properly represent our industry. We don't want to send cows that are too thin. We don't want to send cows that are ill. We don't want to send cows that have cancer eye, that are lame, or, or have problems with, with pendulous udders or other malformations. Make sure that when you send a cow to market, that it's one that you're proud of and it's one that you'd put on the table for your family. And that's today's On the Farm Tip for Bear Animal Health. With BRD, every second counts. And when you get new high-risk cattle, you've got a choice to make. You can either take your chances and wait and see what happens, or you can take charge of BRD. Right from the start, treat bacteria up front with Batro 100 Enrofloxacin Injectable, now approved by the FDA for BRD metaphylaxis and high-risk cattle. Ask your veterinarian about Batro 100 and make it your go-to drug to control BRD and high-risk cattle or for treatment of BRD. Batro 100, right the first time. This hog is head over hoof for meal made from U.S. soybeans. Now, one hog isn't that impressive, but suppose we add another, and another, and another. Before long, you've got billions of hungry customers around the world all clamoring for the same thing. Our soybeans. Learn more about the billion-dollar appetite of animal agriculture at beyondtheelevator.com. Brought to you by America's Soybean Farmers and their checkoff. Working your cattle just got easier. Introducing the new Vet Gun delivery system, a new way to apply topical insecticides to your cattle. The Vet Gun lets you remotely treat cattle with effective parasite control, so you can do it from an ATV, on horseback, or just walking among the herd. It's that simple. The proven topical insecticide AML Vet Cap is used with the Vet Gun. It works fast to control horn flies and lice while minimizing stress on your cattle. Fast, easy, effective. Vet Gun. Check with your animal health supplier for availability. Valley Vet Supply is devoted to providing information and professional quality products at reasonable prices. Valley Vet Supply. True Test Group, weighing systems, electronic identification, EID, electric fencing, and dairy automation systems help farmers and ranchers around the world manage the performance of their livestock for ultimate profitability.
Folks, welcome back to Doc Talk. Dr. Dan Thompson and Dr. Chris Reinhart from the Beef Cattle Institute at Kansas State University. And we're tickled to death to have you here today because we're discussing something that, that really relates to, to everybody involved with beef, whether it's the consumer or the, the retailer or the, the cattle feeder and, and the person providing the genetics. And, and so quality, carcass quality, carcass size, all these are interrelated. And when we left, we were talking about producing that, that higher end carcass. So what are some of the things that, that as far as, you know, we hear yield grade, quality grade, different things that, how do you as somebody deciding that endpoint decide this one's ready to go and this one isn't? Really simply put, I'm glad you started there. If we start at the back of the feeding period and work our way forward, an animal that's ready, in quotes, uh, to go to market and is most likely ready to grade choice, low choice anyway, is going to have a very smooth appearance. There may be a slight appearance of some wasty fat in the brisket and around the tail head, but for the most part it's just a smooth animal. When we're talking a yield grade four, that's too fat really for anyone's program and that's where the discount, the carcass discounts start coming from. And that's when there's a tremendous amount of wastiness through the brisket, between the front legs, down through the flank, et cetera. They're, they're blocky in appearance and they're just... And you start to get that fat really build up around the tail head as far as in the back as well, right? Exactly, the, the back flattens out and, and that becomes waste fat and it's waste for our industry. Uh, an animal that's probably not quite ready to grade low choice yet is going to, we're going to be able to see all the definition of their muscle down through their round and through their, their chuck, their forearm, et cetera. That animal, if they're not yet smooth, they're probably yield grade two and a relatively few number of those are going to be able to grade low choice. So really getting to that yield grade three is, you know, if they, talk to me a little bit about the, the uh, relationship then between quality grade and yield grade. So, you know, I, I hear so many different things. They're not related, they are related. It, it, what is it that, that we should be matching up as far as getting that, that animal that's at the proper yield grade? Are they at the proper quality grade? It, it's, it's a complex equation, but we can simplify it management-wise. There are a small handful of cattle that'll grade low choice at a very lean yield grade two endpoint, but the vast majority of our cattle we've got available today need to be at the very upper end of that yield grade two or even into the yield grade three. And so genetics do play a, a, an important component in determining choice endpoint, but I can start with fantastic genetics and if I harvest them way, way too early and too lean, they're not gonna grade choice either. Yeah. So, so basically, animals have the ability to grade choice or they don't, and once you get them to the proper endpoint, that yield grade two, yield grade three, if they aren't going to grade choice by then, they aren't going to grade choice. Exactly. So what happens then with those animals, I mean, relative to what's the, the choice select spread, because they're going to grade select versus animals that grade choice and prime, you know. Are we seeing a decline in the importance of that or that choice select spread or just depend on the season and the, and, and the number of cattle? It fluctuates tremendously, but, but right now, as we mentioned er earlier, the tremendous uh, demand for red meat and the demand for beef around the world right now has kept uh, the choice select spread fairly static, primarily not because choice is worth less, but because select is worth more. The world wa again, the world wants your product. So, well, we're going to take a break. We're going to come back for the wrap up with Dr. Reinhardt. We're talking about endpoints in cattle. Thanks for watching Doc Talk, and we'll see you here in a minute. The BQA Tip of the Day, sponsored by Beringer Engelheim Vet Medica Inc. Today, we're going to talk about taking care of your syringe and cleaning it after you get done. First thing you want to do is take the syringe and clean the outside with warm soapy water, get all the manure and, and different things off of the syringe. Then you're going to take the syringe apart to clean the inside. On the inside of the syringe, never use soap. Only use warm water to rinse that inside of the syringe out. We're going to let the syringe dry and after it dries, we want to put it in a dust free environment. One of the best places, put it in a Ziploc bag and then put it in your freezer. But before you use the syringe for the next time, Make sure that you allow that syringe to warm up to room temperature. That's today's BQA tip of the day. 
Say this is a calf that's been run through the chute a few too many times. Going through the chute stresses cattle, causing them not to eat like they should. Luckily, Pyramid 5 plus Presponse SQ provides proven protection against key respiratory diseases in a single shot with just one trip through the chute. Talk to your veterinarian about Pyramid 5 plus Presponse SQ and soon your calves will relax and eat like a whole different animal. The Kansas State University College of Veterinary Medicine is a leader in food animal research and education. Our researchers are constantly expanding the knowledge of animal health and food safety. Through the Veterinary Health Center and the Kansas State Veterinary Diagnostic Lab, we provide practical services for animal producers. Home of the Beef Cattle Institute, the college is committed to animal welfare training and research. The Kansas State University College of Veterinary Medicine, knowledge and service for the future of animal production. Hello, I'm Chris Blevins at Kansas State University Veterinary Health Center and the horse tip is first aid. What should you have for your horse, especially when you're going out on different rides? Probably need to, what to be the best thing is talk to your veterinarian. Figure out what list of things would be best to have for you and your horse to prevent different problems and to assess and possibly even to treat in certain emergency situations. We all know about vet wrap and we also know about uh, things for bandaging the leg, but don't forget to have maybe even a stethoscope, thermometer, assessment of the, your animal with a phone, taking a picture, being able to set it to your veterinarian to see what the next thing would be to do. So with first aid, talk to your veterinarian and get what you need. Hello friends, I'm Ernie Rodina. And I'm Don Dawson with the Better Horses Radio Show. For over nine years, we've been bringing the Better Horses Radio Show to markets all across the Midwest. We talk about God, lots about horses. We talk about cows, we talk about horse health, we talk to top trainers, and we even talk about Roy Rogers. We're having a blast with Better Horses Radio Show and would love to take it to a market near you. So visit our website at betterhorsesradio.com and let us or your local radio station know you'd like to hear it in your area. The Better Horses Radio Show is unbelievable. Cow-calf, stalker, and feedlot producers know that effective parasite control improves overall herd performance and profitability. Norbrook offers a comprehensive, economical line of poron and injectable parasiticides for every livestock operation. Consult with your local animal health supplier to set up a program that protects your investment and brings larger cattle checks this fall. See for yourself why the Noromectin line from Norbrook is the practical choice for your herd. This segment is brought to you by the Beef Quality Assurance Program and the Kansas Beef Council, improving animal care and beef safety for more than 20 years. Hey there folks, welcome back to Doc Talk. Dr. Dan Thompson here with Dr. Chris Reinhardt from Kansas State University. Dr. Reinhardt is the Feedlot Extension Specialist and Associate Professor in Animal Sciences. And we left, we've been talking about kind of the past and the migration to the present and Let's look into your crystal ball and, and talk a little bit about the future. As we mentioned before, I, I'm not an ag economist, but all you have to do is look at the cow numbers in the United States and the growing demand around the world for beef, and we simply do not have enough, enough animals to fulfill that demand at a, at a given price. And so they're going to continue to pull product uh, in any number of nations want more beef. Yeah, so let's, let's talk about that a little bit because as we see developing nations become developed, money equals a change in diet. And, you know, we have the upper class, the middle class, and the lower class. And, and as we were discussing during the break, you were talking about the increase in the number of people in that middle class category really driving global beef demand. That's exactly right. It, the people in the in the very, very low income brackets, they're not gonna be able to afford beef anytime soon. But for the people who have an education in these developing countries, they have an education and now a lot of jobs and are coming into that country, uh, stimulating that economy, employing people, and just what you said, more money means a better quality diet and, and they wanna celebrate with beef just like we do here. And so they're gonna move up the food chain as it were and move from 
from lower quality protein sources on a day in, day out basis. And they're going to start replacing that with high quality protein. Not going to go after the tofu and the broccoli sprig, are they? I don't see that as a growth market. <laughs> Especially when you're making more money. Um, I think it's a bright future for beef production. I think that it's probably, probably hasn't been as as bright as it is right now for, for a long, long time. And, and you're going to see a lot of people starting to get involved. It's really exciting. And there's, there's growth opportunities no matter what type of beef you're producing. The, the high quality market is there, but simply producing beef today is, is a winning proposition. Well, folks, thanks for watching us today on Doc Talk and Dr. Reinhardt. Thanks for uh, being with us here. Great show. Yep, it was. It was really good. Good information. Learning more about beef. And, uh, you know, if you want to be a cowboy and you want to get involved in the business, there's opportunities out there today to, to get started. Move to the country, buy a piece of land, and start raising some cattle. If you want to know more about what we do here at the, at the Beef Cattle Institute at Kansas State University, you can find us on the web at www.vet.ksu.edu, or you can find the archive shows of Doc Talk at www.doctalktv.com. This is Dan Thompson. Remember, always work with your local veterinarian. I'm Dr. Dan Thompson. Thanks for joining us today on Doc Talk, and I'll see you down the road. Closed caption brought to you by AgriLabs, the perfect pairing of performance and value. Doc Talk was brought to you by Beringer Engelheim Vet Medica Inc., the makers of Pyramid 5 plus Presponse SQ, a market leader in combination respiratory vaccines.